Hey, what's up everybody, and welcome back to The Sanctuary. I'm your host, Professor C, and today I'll be taking us through another a &P study session. Today specifically, I'll be talking about elements and atoms. So without any further business, let's get right to it. Remember, if we're looking at our hierarchy of life, we can start in the atomic level and make our way up to molecules and cells and so forth. But we're going to begin small here in the atomic world. So oftentimes you hear the word matter. And I really like this picture because it shows, well, basically it shows all the main forms of matter that you talk about in normal life. There are other forms of matter, but we define it as something, anything that has mass, or you could say weight on the earth and takes up space by having some sort of, you know, volume to it. So let's look at the types of matter. And again, we can see all three in this picture. They're called the states or phases of matter. Solid, like the iceberg here, is what's water, which is definitely matter. It has mass, weight, and it takes up space. Uh, but it's solid there. It's a defined volume, a defined shape. Still water, but it's in the form of a solid. Well, down below it here, it's floating in, it looks like. I'm not quite sure, but it's in the water. Uh, water, water, uh, liquid water, that is, with a defined volume, but it's got a changeable shape. In fact, you can see the waves rippling on it. And if I were to take this picture, say, five seconds from now, the iceberg would look the same, but the water would look different. It would change its shape. And of course, if you look up in the sky here, you can see some clouds, which we know is just water vapor, you know, little tiny droplets of water that has floated or formed way up in the sky. So this is water in the gaseous or gas state of matter, changeable volume and a changeable shape. So the three phases are the three states of matter. Yes, there are others. You may have heard of plasma, like in a plasma TV, for instance. Uh, it is an ionized gas, and it's kind of out of our wheelhouse here. You are not made of plasma, and we don't talk about uh, that kind of plasma unless it's like a blood plasma, right? But that's a totally, totally different story. Okay, another big concept uh, is energy. And quite frankly, if you're asked a question in biology and your answer is energy, you're, you're probably right on target somewhere. It might not be the best answer you could give, but it's all about energy at the end of the day. So it's, we usually define it as the ability to do work by exerting some force on matter, causing it to move somehow. And again, that sounds very vague if you haven't studied it more in depth, but that's okay. We can keep it vague uh, here. See a wonderful picture of a lightning storm on the right side of the slide here. But let's see. Let's talk about some of the uh, the energies that we may discuss in in A and P, and which one you see here in the storm. Perhaps you can think of it before we give it away. So, potential energy, very good term. Potential energy is stored energy. If you want to think about it, you can think about say a slide at the playground. We have a kid climbs up to the top and they're about to slide down the slide. The kid at the top, even though he's just sitting there waiting to come down, he, he has some energy inside of him. He's got some stored energy and he's not moving, you know, down the slide. But as he went up the steps, he attained more and more of this potential energy and he's storing it. If you want to go down the slide, you're going to release that energy all of a sudden. It's going to transform from one form of energy to another. And this energy of motion is kinetic energy, the energy of motion. Uh, we will talk about bonding and how bonds are a form of potential energy. It says there chemical energy is stored in chemical bonds. So when atoms combine to form molecules, you will notice this bond formation occurs and that's a way to store energy. If we wanted to release that energy later, we could by simply breaking that bond and liberating the energy. These are common themes you'll see when we talk about, oh, metabolism and nutrition. Electrical energy, well, I bet that's the one we see over here. 
a flow of charged particles. Again, what's a charged particle? What does all that mean? Well, we'll get into some of that in this lecture. The elements. And we see here uh, what we would call the periodic table of elements. So I do see, you know, just look around up here. I see, a, you know, 5B and 6C and 13 Al and 14 Psi. And what the heck is all this if I've never seen it before? We're just looking at a list of all the elements that we know about. So B5 would be standing for boron. C would be carbon. And I know everyone's heard about carbon somewhere before, but let's think about this real quick. There are 92 natural ones. So I can go down here and I can put a circle around number 92 uranium. And yes, it is debatable how many elements are naturally occurring if you'd like to jump down that rabbit hole. But most people in most classes will it suffice to say there are 92 naturally occurring ones. Where do the other ones come from? Well, they're, they're either made in a lab or they're temporary products of some sort of radioactive decay. But again, that's, that's beyond our wheelhouse here. So I see C6, right? And I want to talk about that one because carbon is a very important one and we'll see it a lot in this talk and in lots and lots of talks in biology because uh, you may have heard the term carbon-based life forms. We are definitely that, as is all life on Earth. So let's think about carbon. Let's pretend we had a big chunk of it, just like that. Or maybe maybe think of a, a charcoal briquette or something like that. And let's assume it was like pure carbon, even though I know it's not pure carbon. Let's just assume that we have a chunk of pure carbon. And I put this big old chunk of it on a table and I give you a hammer, right? I give you a big mallet. I tell you, smash that chunk. And you smash it. Well, what will happen? Well, it will break off into pieces, of course. And you'll have several large chunks, but they're smaller than what they used to be, right? There'll be chunks like that. And I tell you to keep hitting it. And, and, and you'll make smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller pieces, right? And eventually, if you sit there and keep pounding it and pounding it, you'll have these little tiny particles of this charcoal brigade. You've pretty much turned it into dust at this point. It starts blowing in the air and off the table. The point is this. If it started as carbon and you smash it into bigger chunks or smaller chunks of the big piece, it's still carbon, right? And then you smash it even smaller, smaller pieces, it's still carbon. And you smash it even fine dust particles of that charcoal briquette. It's still carbon, right? And so the question becomes, is there a point in which you can't smash it any further? Is there a smallest piece of carbon? And there sure is, is the answer. So we're going to call this very smallest piece that we could smash it down to if you had a magical hammer and can keep on. So you could get to what's called an atom. Now, I've seen that word before. Uh, because we know the atom is the basis for how to build a life form. We start at the atomic level. So, yes, you can break an atom down. We'll see that it's made of smaller particles as well. But not in any normal chemical way can you do that. Uh, for our purposes, the atom will be the smallest uh, unit of our hierarchy. Although we will see things called subatomic particles that build up the atom. So a good definition is saying the atom is the smallest part of an element that still retains its properties. It can't be broken down by normal, keyword there, normal chemical means. There are ways to do it, of course. You've seen an atomic bomb go boom. Each element, like carbon, and boron, and aluminum, and the others you see here, has unique characteristics. And you see the numbers there, they must mean something, and they're not just, you know, to put them in order. They do have some meaning, and some periodic tables have lots of numbers around them. And some of these properties, if you know what you're looking for, you can determine how an atom of one such element would bond with, or hook up with, another atom of another element. Or maybe other atoms of that same element, and how it would form long chains of that element. If you're ever asked about the most common elements and again that periodic table there's 92 like normal ones and then there's some strange man-made ones and they're beyond it but we don't need to learn 92 elements to deal with life life keeps it very simple in fact when you think about life 
we can put a, a number here and it varies in different texts, but it's about 96%. 96% of all life is made of just four elements. Four, that's it, just four. And it spells out C-H-O-N, Chon. Carbon, which is probably what this is and this is. And I only know that because I've had some experience. Hydrogen, which is probably right here. And you see the bond in between? We'll get into that concept later. There's some atoms of hydrogen. Looks like there's one peeking off the board on the right. Two of them peeking off the board on the left. Okay, fine. O for oxygen. Probably this red guy here. Orange, okay, fair enough. And then N for nitrogen. It's probably this fellow here. And if you know anything about chemistry, uh, you would recognize this molecule as being an amino acid. But that is far in our future. When you're done with my lecture series, you will be able to identify that as an amino acid. But for now, we're just saying this is a very common type of molecule in a human body or any other living thing. And it's made of C, H, O, and N exclusively here. Although it could have other things attached. So Chon would represent the top four elements that make up life. If you added the fifth one here, phosphorus, which isn't shown in this molecule, but phosphorus would be the fifth one, so it would spell chomp. Okay, there are some other elements that are required to perform, it says here, vital metabolic functions, some sorts of chemical reactions, maybe acting as coenzymes. I know there's a lot of words that are thrown at you we haven't covered yet in my lectures. So we only need these in small amounts to perform very specific functions. So, you know, if you could say chon, chomp, makes, you know, 96, 98 maybe percent, these here would represent the other missing percentages here. These are what we call trace elements. You don't need very much of them. You just need trace amounts. As usual, thanks for watching. If you want, check out the other videos in the series. See you next time. Bye-bye.